Welcome to the Fat Cats Rugby Podcast, bringing you candid rugby conversations, great interviews and insights into Ugandan rugby, and a touch of rugby in Africa and the world over. Fat Cats Rugby Podcast is a product of Fat Cats Media Brand for all your audiovisual content needs and equipment hire. Hope you enjoy this episode. Yeah, Fat Cats Podcast, um, different location, uh, details to be shared, clandestine location, uh, but with a, a guest who is known for another place that we usually do our podcasts, a regular together in Nigeria, but <laughs> that's for his co-curricular activities. Usually he's a sports lawyer, a rather prolific one at that. A friend of mine, Ivan Ojako. How are you? I'm well, I'm well. Thank you very much for hosting me, and I'm uh, honored to be on the podcast. podcast. Yeah, you've been on this space before, mm. and uh, <coughs> where we discussed uh, the training issue oh, yes. of, of image rights and how players can best position themselves to be in a in a in a better case for when to negotiate uh, deals or transactions regarding their images. True. Have there been any any developments now, or we still rely on FUFA? FUFA is our <laughs> Bible when it comes to image rights. I haven't seen any really um, in Uganda, at least. So, uh, but, but but I believe uh, since that dispute, uh, there could have been some uh, housekeeping here there from the different federations, or them trying to ensure that they are uh, in line with the law, or that it, they don't fall afoul of the law as far as image rights are concerned. But uh, I could be overestimating or being too overly ambitious mm. uh, of, of some of the people that run this federation, and I'm sure inevitably uh, there could be uh, more people for, for running afoul of, of the law on image rights since that for dispute than those that are complying with it. Yeah. Yeah, so with that context of background of when we had that <coughs> space, maybe just to let people know. Why sports? Why did you pick sports law as an area to specialize in? <laughs> there are guys who do different areas and whatever. So, why sports law? To be honest, I was sort of inadvertent. And I, I've always been a sports jockey of sorts. Uh, yeah. Sports aficionado who watches on a good weekend. Mm. When there's a good DSTV subscription. Yes. What about four to five sports over the weekend? So, inevitably, there are a couple of other areas which I still specializing and having to see it from IP to meet the general commercial areas of contract as you see, uh, tech. <clears throat> so because there's a strong interlinkage, for example, between uh, intellectual property and sports. So for example, you mentioned image rights. Uh, if you're a lawyer who's interested in, in intellectual property uh, and you know about, for example, the Winnie Asege case, mm. then if you know about the Winnie Asege case, then you read about Mo Salah, and his dispute with the Egyptian Federation. Yes. Then you start to realize, okay, there's an interlinkage here. And then you also realize that there is a hobby that you love. On the weekend, you go to Chadondo Rugby Club or, or you be on TV watching the Premiership. And you're like, you know what? Uh, there is a hobby here and there is a way I can bring it into my practice or my profession. Yeah. Or there's a way I can make money out of it. Or there's even a way beyond making money that I can give back to the community. Uh, of, of sports people who bring a lot of joy and glory to us as a country. So you're like, you know what, let me check it out, let me try it out, let me see how it goes. Before you know it, one thing leads to the other. And uh, one day you get a call from a sports editor, sorry, an editor, sports editor. He tells me, so Ivan, I, I think you have good knowledge about sports mm. and the law, aren't you trying something? So you write an article, he tells you, write more and more and more before you know it, you've fallen deep into it. And uh, almost every week you're reading up on the latest case from somewhere. Yes. You say buying books. You say looking for master's programs. Yes. <laughs> so you, without necessarily intending, have become a sports lawyer. And then you realize, okay, this thing is actually big out there. Yes. The guys are proper making a kiwi. Uh, but also importantly, again, like many other areas of law, African lawyers or Africans generally have been left out of it. If you go to a sports program uh, run under FIFA, they usually have diplomas they run. You always find about two Africans, or even if Simba mm. or Yanga in Tanzania or whichever big club has a sports dispute, there will always be some Argentine lawyer chosen, yeah. some British lawyer, some Italian lawyer, 
I'm like, okay, but it's an area we can get into. So like that, I found myself into the area and uh, building expertise slowly and incrementally. And thankfully, uh, I seem to have gotten a claim or at least recognition uh, as far as it's concerned. Yeah. Well, for those of you who want to look for someone to talk to about sports law, mm -hmm. here is the man, Ivan or Jacob. Uh, for those of you watching, this is the Fat Cats podcast. I think this is the shoot edition <laughs> where we're going to discuss totally law. I think that's why Ruben has handed over it to me <laughs> to discuss uh, legal issues that will be arising out of many things that have happened the last yeah. one or two weeks in respect to Ugandan rugby, yes. particularly. There are some articles you have written out very much want us to get into them. Mm. What does it mean to bring a game or a sport into disrepute? So that's the discussion we really want to have today. And <coughs> just inform the, the, the viewers who are watching and those who will be listening on audio platforms. We have had um, what you would call the Uncovering Facts series of the Fatcast podcast, where we are dissecting the matters and affairs affecting the disciplinary proceedings going against Ivan Magom, uh, particularly in respect to the charge of referees uh, assault, which has been since decided in his favor, that has been dismissed. But then there is the glaring issue of what it means to bring the sport into disrepute. This is a charge that has been uh, put out against very, very many uh, players in different fields. But if you focus on rugby, it's one of those that has stuck that your particular action or misconduct in a particular way has put the game of rugby into disrepute. So I think Ivan and I are going to have this discussion, what it means to bring a game or a sport, in this case rugby, into disrepute. So Ivan, you dissected something in your article. You had an article over the weekend uh, where you dissected the matter of um, what it means to bring the game into disrepute. What key criteria or what key things should one look out for as a player, mm. particularly when it comes to um, bringing a game into disrepute, particularly from a conduct perspective? Okay, uh, just to give uh, where this term uh, perhaps arose from uh, a bit of context, um, uh, because of the nature of sport and its increased commercialization over the years, uh, sportsmen are no longer just sportsmen, they are products that must be sold out there. We are role models uh, that must keep good reputation and good behavior in public in order to inspire the next generation <coughs> to take over from them. Uh, but importantly, as far as the product is concerned, and because they are a product, it also means that uh, those overseeing them, clubs, federations, sports governing bodies, want to ensure their products are properly protected or even are still marketable out there. Yes. So increasingly, and over the years, in just about uh, any sports legislation that you find out there, from the Premier League to rugby to wherever, there will always be a clause, a disrepute clause. <coughs> and uh, uh, they always have that term, bringing the sport into, into, into disrepute. Uh, be it in a code of conduct of players, be it in a, a regulation, whatever. Always be something about uh, disrepute. And also because of this day and age of social media, and uh, the digital era, uh, it is important that clubs or people overseeing or running the product that is sports uh, ensure that uh, their, their people are, are in line, especially with their commercial interests. For example, you don't want a sportsman or a player of a national team uh, going and saying bad things about a sponsor uh, or uh, saying posting pornography in their Yes, on their uh, X page or Facebook page, etc. So hence the development of that term. Now, <clears throat> uh, because it is, uh, it seems to be something where we put that uh, sports governing bodies, federations, etc. have used over time in order to discipline in courts, discipline, uh, and I'm, I'm using that deliberately because yes. it's also a tool to come or dissent, dissent especially yes. in our part of the world where. Things like accountability and, and transparency, the running of things generally is, is almost unheard of. So, uh, coming descent, so that tool has been used very many times as, as a stick, as a weapon to discipline uh, uh, these people. So, hence, 
bringing the sport into this rapid being uh, uh, incorporated in many, uh, say, codes of conduct of players or even uh, constitutions of sports governing bodies, etc. Uh, the only challenge, though, is in line with that concept of bringing it, uh, sorry, of, of using that term or that concept uh, for selfish reasons other than from a, a proper <coughs> uh, uh, policy perspective of ensuring that sports integrity is maintained. Uh, many times you'll find that uh, in many of these legislations, sports legislations, it is put there for the sake of just being put there without any serious reason. In other words, the, the drafting will always be problematic, for example, without any proper clarity. <clears throat> for example, there will be no proper definition of what it means, yeah. or even examples of, 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 of what would entail that, for example, are you going to, will it be racism, will it be uh, someone uh, conducting themselves in, in, in uh, a very uncouth way, or someone uh, being involved in match fixing, or someone uh, doing drugs, etc. So it becomes a problem like that. And <clears throat> because of that, as we have seen in, for example, the Ivan Magomo uh, case, uh, there is usually a problem of conflating the players, because the player first opened that social media page, yes. maybe at, say, 15 years, when he just yes. wanted to interact with friends and catch up. Uh, and because now they're a superstar and the captain of a national team, or uh, the product that you want to sell to a sponsor, you now want to say that even what they post on their social media uh, should be uh, regulated. So if a player, for example, uh, posts themselves there at the bar, and for example, get into a fight at the bar, yes, <clears throat> you're going to take them on for that. Remember, usually, like I mentioned, because of the uh, uh, putting the disrepute close case, sorry, close in, in, in sports legislation, just for the sake of it, and also maybe copying and pasting it from wherever, you have not properly defined. So a guy is on his phone of his own at night yes. in the bar, gets into a fight, posts it on social media, and then you say they are bringing the sport into disrepute. Uh, but over time, what has happened, in a couple of decisions, uh, 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 I think there's one called Zobko versus FINA, FINA the uh, sports federation that regulates uh, swimming internationally. Uh, I think there was a guy who was uh, at the 2004 Olympics. He was uh, uh, a coach of uh, a swimming national team of, I think, Ukraine or something like that. And then he, one of his daughters was yes. a swimmer. Now, the daughter, I think the guy had not approved of the guys who were hitting on her or the boyfriends. Yes. Yeah, she, she had chosen. As all fathers should. <laughs> mm. He got into a proper scuffle with her, and I think he even slapped her, pushed her out. Uh, before you know it, Fina is coming for the guy and saying, you know what, you're putting our sport into disrepute. By beating your daughter. To displaying your daughter. Exactly, displaying your daughter. Mm. <coughs> You've uh, uh, embarrassed us, what have you, even uh, took him on and, of course, found him liable through the disciplinary proceedings. But again, appealed to CAS. CAS is a court of arbitration for sport, which is more or less the apex uh, dispute resolution body when it comes to sports matters. Uh, CAS say no, uh, this was a personal thing, really. And... Uh, uh, Sports into disrepute should not be conflated with personal, uh, uh, personal misdemeanors, personal, <coughs> uh, personal actions, and, and and that becomes a problem because that many times because of the failure to divorce a sportsman from uh, who they are as a person, who they are as a human being, who they are as a lawyer, who they are as a father. Yes, uh, and then you're saying that because uh, they have disciplined courts discipline their daughter or, or <laughs> therefore they are liable for bringing the sport into disrepute. But importantly, CAS set out a test. Yeah, what amounts to bring the sport into disrepute is not just a case of you potentially thinking about it. It's not about your feelings, mm. your ego being hurt. It's about actual proof. In other words, for example, you go on social media or you go and check, get out sports articles from wherever or newspaper articles and, and you see people are now saying, his actions show that he's bringing the sport of swimming into disrepute. Or you see whatever is going viral on social media. So it should be like someone proper, is cancelling sponsorship exactly, because exactly, of that. Exactly. So proper evidential proof. So just a matter of you uh, just potentially throwing it out there to bring the sport into, into disrepute. You must properly prove that he did someone has uh, brought the sport into disrepute. No, so, but when you when you look yeah, at it from this yeah. perspective, <clears throat> now I think what you're basically saying is that. Yeah. For every matter which involves bringing the sport into disrepute, yeah. it's, it, it depends on the area you're at. Exactly. For example, if in Uganda, 
there are very many things I could say or do. Yes. That in one way or the other, my personal account could bring yes. the game into disrepute. Yes. Yes. Or for example, I could say something, maybe ra- a racial slur or something like that. Yeah. And um, in doing so, I could be putting on my national team jersey. Yeah. Or I say I'm the captain of the national team and I say this. But now, what? How do players get around this? Because you see, you're saying it should be actual. It should yeah. not be yeah. perceived and the like. But yeah. Now I think we can't avoid it. We, we we have to go into the the, the matter of, of Ivan Magom. Absolutely. Because now for me personally, if I look at it this way, I am the NCS boss. Yeah. You are throwing up innuendo. You are basically putting out the innuendo that I am a corrupt gentleman. That's something that is not taken very very lightly when it comes to instances of. Uh, yeah. Of, of of maybe ethics or yes. even yeah. even public perception. I'm 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 being perceived as someone who is actually corrupt. Whereas, mm. uh, notwithstanding other reports we have had of refunds and the like, mm. I have not been adjudged anywhere to be corrupt. Be corrupt. And not only that as a case scenario, but yeah. even very many instances. Why should I? Uh, why should I, as a sports union, not mm. exercise my right to? To whip my players into line. Yeah. Why should someone go mm. and think because they are sportsman, they don't owe a duty or responsibility mm. to manage their social media in, in, in order? That becomes a trick. And, and inevitably, uh, of course, unfortunately, um, and of course, all of this goes into the wider sports ecosystem in Uganda. Uh, we're still being, us still being in, a, in an amateur sports setting, uh, yeah. not even semi-pro. Uh, so, the sportsman has perhaps not woken up to the reality that they are they are bigger than they think they are, or perhaps could impact on public opinion uh, uh, more than they think they are. Yes. Yet you've forgotten that perhaps there's that kid in school <coughs> who has been inspired by your exploits on the pitch mm. or, or, or whatever great things you've done over the years. So and, and all of that again comes down to the wider sports ecosystem of you know we have not properly created professional professional sports study. For example, you say, and, and I'm going to ask your, your, your other uh, uh, question later, uh, when you say the code of conduct of players, yeah. URU is a governing body of sports in Uganda. URU deals with clubs, right? Yeah. So whichever club subscribes to the constitution becomes a member, right? But in becoming a member, it also means in, inevitably, the players playing under the club are also, in one way or the other, bound or governed yeah, by URU. By, by you are, yes. But how many of these clubs, for example, have, for example, if it's a law of contract, there's a constitution here, then there's a code of conduct. But if you find out how many players have contracts in rugby, for example, how many, how many clubs do actually offer contracts to, to players? Yeah. So that, that becomes a bit of a challenge because they... The contracting of the player, if a club is bound and has signed up all these documents that make it a member of URU, yes. how is the player going to be bound by URU? Is it just by just participating in URU tournaments and, and, and signing documents? So, so I'm, I'm talking about the, 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 the trickle down of the regulation yes. to the player is in and of itself not proper yet. So, for example, if a player decides not to respect uh, you are use regulations or, or, or laws or whatever. Or guidance. Or guidance. They give. They give. Yeah, I mean, because he didn't sign, <laughs> because he didn't sign anything. There's nothing yes. properly binding him to the member of you are you. You get it, huh? So all of this comes out of the wider sports governance problems in the country. And inevitably, that's why we have uh, 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 these challenges of players saying, okay, uh, you don't really care about being a sport, you should be stupid or whatever. Oh. So, but inevitably, as the sport grows, and hopefully it will grow in the near future, uh, inevitably, sportsmen will have to have social media handlers or things okay, like that. Social media handlers, yeah. yes. But also, inevitably, clubs also need to regulate the handling of social media. Uh, so, or clubs be, internally, 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 internally yes. yes. I mean, there should be regulations. I mean, this happens a lot in the professional world. Should, there should be do's and don'ts of so social media. This you can post, this you cannot post. But now, back to the real issue. And the problem here is that you and I are lawyers and we look at it in line with the concept of. Uh, uh, innocent until proven guilty. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's where I'm going. Yeah, innocent until proven guilty. Uh, but uh, and, and it's a bit of a, 
of a tricky area, of a murky area, because he is a person who is not yet pronounced guilty by anyone. Exactly. But they're all is they are just reports. insinuations yeah. and <laughs> allegations. So, yeah, allegations yes. from, from parliament, from the IGG. So if a gentleman like uh, Ivan Magov jumps on what is already out there, yes. Uh, over uh, you call it overwhelming evidence, but, overwelming but evidence not, in courts, yes. <laughs> but it has not been pronounced upon by a court of law. Uh, someone may argue it perhaps may not be uh, bringing the spot bringing the spot to discipline because he's more or less making a, what should what we would call a fair comment. Uh, he's more or less uh, uh, talking about something that is already more or less judicially noticed out there. Yes. Yeah? Even if a court has not pronounced itself, but there are all his reports, all his reports about the gentleman. Mm. But that, of course, does not make uh, 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 Dr. Ogwell guilty of anything that yes. is out there. So, but maybe, inevitably, uh, going forward, uh, that is perhaps a lesson for... Of course, there must be a balancing act between uh, freedom of speech uh, uh, and all the other rights enshrined down under our, our constitution. And the right of the player to exercise his personality with their obligations as a player. And that, that is where the balance act comes in. Because inevitably, as, as a player or as a sportsman, or even as a lawyer, yes. and, and this also brings into play the whole argument of amateur versus professional. Professional, yes. Because the man is a lawyer. Mm. Even if, even if he, he may actually be spending more time doing legal work and all the other professional work, That's more than he plays rugby. Yeah. And so, it comes a bit of a challenge uh, bringing full force some of those concepts from the more developed world in this part of the world. Because in an amateur sports setting, how much control in, in a sports setting where there are no contracts for players? Well, some players don't even earn a shilling. But how much at, control look at, is look there? At it this way. Yeah? Look at it this way. The, yes. the union cognizant of those scenarios yes. of how challenging it is yeah. to have every player have a contract. Yeah. Is say let's deal with the club. You understand? Let's mm. deal with the club. Yeah. Sign a sign the constitution, mm. sign tournament manual, and you as a club you have undertaken to register your players. Yes. So in your undertaking to register these players, these players are in essence bound by laws and mm. governance structures yes. and whatever yes. that applies to the union. Yes. And I think that has been a very big issue why many many players talk about that we did not sign a contract. Exactly. And I think maybe just even for context is that particular clubs also have the the what they would call the registration forms mm. where you sign and you agree to particular undertakings yeah. like code of conduct. And I think that's why the clubs need to come in and educate more. Mm. But now in a scenario of this nature, the union has dealt with the clubs and the clubs have to do the trickle down. How feasible is it? I don't think it's very feasible to ask a club of whatever stature to now go and monitor what someone has said on social media mm. or come up with a policy yeah. to kind of do that. Look at this case, and I think this is something very, very important that mm. we need to discuss here, yeah. maybe before we break. <clears throat> Israel Falau, mm. very, very importantly, I think very many people know that yeah. what happened to him. He came up on his social media, yeah. and, <laughs> and, and I think it was Instagram, and he mentioned something about, he quoted the Bible verse. Mm. Uh, talking about um, people of the LGBT nation, mm, mm. Uh, alcoholics, adulterers, and some other, I think, fornicators. He quoted the Bible and said, uh, repent now or you will go to hell. <coughs> and that brought a lot of turmoil in the, the rugby, uh, rugby sphere in Australia. Mm, mm. Because particularly, this is a guy who, who many would argue farmed mm. a $4 million Australian uh, mm. contract mm. uh, where he was basically being paid all that money over a period of time mm. because of expressing his views. Mm. Now, even with a social media policy that you're advocating for a club, per se cannot control mm. how many characters on X these days. Mm. Is 200 something. <laughs> yeah. You cannot control my 200 something yeah. characters. Yeah. So now the balance, and one of the things he raised in argument is saying that I have the right to practice my religion mm. and I did not actually directly attack, but I quoted the Bible verse. True. So, same thing here. We have very many players dictate uh, what they are able to post and what not to post. Mm. And I think even in, um, if you draw similar parallels with mm. uh, Magom and uh, Israel Palau, 
one of the things that had been highlighted was that in Magom's case, he had been charged before with bringing the game into dispute, mm -hmm. for which he pleaded guilty and served his time a six month match ban. And then Falau was pointed out by Rugby Australia saying that these posts you make are kind of alienating our fans mm. who feel like you're directly using the scriptures to attack them. Mm. And he undertook not to do so. And on that basis, he managed to sign a four million Australian dollar contract. Mm. So now, in the scenarios, now we find ourselves people different years, but they find themselves in the same pit, which is particularly bring the game into dispute. Mm. So now, my now to you is that for a player watching this, what do they need to do in respect not to one? Okay, in respect to exercising their rights mm. within what you'd say confines of a policy. Mm. Uh, how do the players express themselves? I think. Do you need to say for me as me uh, as we Ugandans usually say, mm -hmm. or you say personally? My view is yes, yes. to avoid to 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 say that you have taken out mm -hmm. the general perception of yeah. you being a rugby player, but you're saying yeah. as my person, yeah. as myself. Okay, of course, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, it seems to be a murky subject and an area that we perhaps need more time to properly study this part of the world, especially because we live in an amateur sports setting. Uh, but social media handlers, it's also an opportunity now for people uh, skilled in that area to come and advise or even take opportunity and, and get uh, clients playing sport. But disclaimers, yes, like you mentioned, can come in handy, I believe. But also, as far as I'm concerned, and, and this is a problem with sports regulation, it's usually a very unbalanced uh, contract negotiation uh, terrain, yes. As opposed to you, our normal workplace, you go to a place, you demand, I want this amount of money, you see, yeah. you pop it. But here you are. First of all, a club has already signed up to some constitution, wherever, mm. which perhaps you're not a party to, and for you, just coming to play. But remember, whatever quarter, whatever document you're going to sign, this club flows from where mandates for that constitution, yeah, which has mandatory provisions, which which is as if. And uh, many times they take it or leave it. The union will say, come and sign our constitution. If you're not a part of it, you look at places. Yeah. You get your, whatever document it will be. And, and, and that has been some of the criticism when it comes to sport regulation. It seems to be overly draconian mm. more than sports employment, sports, you know, and, and it seems to stretch beyond the normal, uh, uh, the, the normal <coughs> boundaries uh, of, of life. I, 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 and, and, and that becomes a problem because. <coughs> Uh, and, and I understand because many a time, uh, extraordinarily, beyond yes. you and I who are employed wherever, uh, these guys are looked at as, as products, commercial yeah. products. We must, yes, we want you to earn money, but oh, even us, we're going to use you to earn money. Yes. Uh, and I mean, well, Fat Cats is, is yeah. adding money of sportsmen. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Talk about rugby. Yeah. So, so it, it, is, it is something quite unique. And, and, and the draconian nature of sport regulation, sports employment, and whatever around sports is something that is really. Uh, has been debated through academia and all over the international sports law world. So uh, I, I think disclaimers could come in handy, but also importantly, uh, individual negotiation have, I mean, if, if a club, uh, and these are questions, all these are points you could raise when you negotiate your contract, or even yeah. have special clauses of, you know, for me, when I want to talk about this, I can talk about whatever I want. You, you, my employment shall not extend to my social media, or something like that. Yes. So individual contracting would, would, would perhaps come in handy. Uh, but of course, uh, again, because of the nature of these things, many times uh, someone is just uh, literally just imposed documents on you and things on you. And because you want to play and you look at it as fun, I just want to play, have, you know, uh, win for my club or whatever yeah. and go home and practice my profession as an engineer. Yeah. You see, but there are wider ramifications for some of these things, as, as you can see. So uh, perhaps there's, there's an opportunity and it is an area uh, where social media handlers, social media professionals could come in handy in as far as helping our, our sports people uh, deal with their social media uh, better. But also uh, individual contract negotiations as far as I'm concerned. But also for me, uh, how extremist or how draconian should the regulation or sports employment go? Uh, well, there's a, a contest between 
a human right. Yes. Like expression. And 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 like freedom of contract religion and a contract of employment. What yeah, what should take the day? But but, but here yeah, the <laughs> players so, are not am, necessarily uh, employed. Uh, uh, but yes, let's say yes. okay, let's assume yes. they, they are employed. Let's yes. say, let's assume they are yes. employed, they, employed. they get a salary mm. at the end of the month. Yes. How to balance those interests. Yeah. Exactly. Whether whether or not the the debate around the money trickling down or whether yes. they get their money they're supposed to get, but there's a document and I don't know for how long it runs. For example, yes. the national team player you sign a code of conduct or whatever it is, uh, you may not perhaps be chosen the next circuits, the next two circuits, but in the front circuit you could be chosen. Yes. Uh, how long does that document go on? You see, but uh, and, and that becomes a very interesting area because it could be also a, a lacuna that perhaps our sports governing bodies should look into of just how far should their regulation or how far does it go in terms of, uh, I, I mean, if, if I last played for uh, the national team five years ago, am I still a national team player? How far? And, 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 and of course, we many times, unfortunately, don't have access to these documents that players sign. For example, the Mogobo documents are already leaked yeah. because of, of this current spot. Yes. But otherwise, uh, there's, there's need also for, for these things to be out there so that uh, players can be well advised or properly advised. But for me, a contest between a, a right uh, as long as the right in line with our, what is it called, the limitation clause, limitation, the, yeah, yeah. The, 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 as long as you're not infringing on other people's rights, uh, or as long as you're properly exercising it, uh, you think there's no issue whatsoever. You could have, you, you could take the day. And I think that's one of the arguments that, unfortunately, the, the matter never really saw the light, uh, we never really got, got a judgment or whatever. Because I think Israel Fallow and uh, Australian. Rugby union sorted the matter out of court. Yeah, so I think one of his arguments was that me um, exercising my right, exercising my right to, to practice religion, to religion exactly, and and I can't uh, be deemed to have discriminated. Exactly. So, so there, there, there's a, a tricky balance, and all of this uh, people are interested in academia, in these areas. Maybe yes, uh, we should get some more papers and, and so they can know how to <laughs> how to go about these things. But sports yeah. inevitably, from just those examples, shows you just how extreme it can be. Yeah, for what is supposed to be uh, fun and games. Yeah, area that it goes and regulates even your, your bedroom yes. yeah, and how you should conduct your personal life, which is not the normal employment for you and I. You can go and drink beer from here, you can yes. go and do crazy things, and our yes, employers are not as we are sitting at <laughs> Exactly. As long, but if it brings this to this, we have a right to enter. Yes, we are here at, uh, uh, talking sports and distribute at uh, the Kapala Business Lounge, uh, a premium center of um, serenity, and at the same time, place of peace where you can have your meetings, set up your conference, uh, set up your talks from here, and at the same time also be able to indulge in the local and key restaurant. Uh, plenty of uh, discounts, happy hours uh, on particular se selected days, as well as also having the opportunity to engage in uh, some fine dining uh, from the restaurant and the chefs who provide this. A, a very serene environment, as you see. Uh, very spacious and comfortable for those who would want to take their time off. So do come to the Royal Complex that is near the old taxi park. Uh, come to the fourth floor at the Kampala Business Lounge and just be ushered into the hospitality of the local and key restaurant who at the same time enjoy the facilities and utilities uh, that come with the Kampala Business Lounge when it comes to being your favorite meeting spot uh, to conduct your business before you engage in acts of distribute. <laughs> yeah, back here, uh, Fat Cats Podcast took a short uh, break here to just appreciate the marvel of the Kampala Business Lounge. And uh, shockingly, we have been, uh, or rather happily, we have relocated and now we are in the the boardroom where the business deals are signed. Ivan, would you very much want to sign a player contract here Properly. for for for, yeah. for some rugby players and say that look, <laughs> you have managed to sign your contract with your club, mm -hmm. and we are doing the unveiling here at the Kampala Business Lounge. It's beautiful, splendid. It's a beautiful place, and without a doubt. And, and trust me, I think any player who decides to come here as a location, yes, will get a very good deal. Huh? <laughs> we'll get a very good deal. <laughs> yeah, so back from the break, um, we, I think, managed to do justice on what it means to bring the sport into disrepute. From the different discussions that have been on social media, 
as well as those that we have had um, amongst ourselves. Now, I think, talking about contracting and signing a contract here, many calls have been made on social media for players to, 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 to use this opportunity to make a step in the right direction, which is either to unionize or unify their voices uh, in respect to aspects of welfare. And uh, I think one of the key things about welfare they have highlighted is um, things of like medical insurance, uh, better pay allowances, uh, contracting, as well as uh, maybe terms of medi good uh, medical uh, checkups and the like. So when it comes to sports and uh, unionization, you and I watch the NBA. We are very much aware that they have a collective bargaining agreement where, where they have a players' union. I think the current president is CJ McCollum yes. of, uh, of uh, New Orleans Pelicans. And uh, I think even other sports, need, even the NFL. Isn't it uh, the Boston Celtics guy? What's the name? Brown. Jalen Brown? Jalen Brown. Unless Jalen. the regime changed. I remember there was Chris Paul, then there was this other guy. So now, in respect to that, in abstract, it looks something very easy and, and uh, straightforward. But what 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 recommendations? Because you see, for me personally, I think that to unionize, you need to get as many players as possible in a room. Mm. Uh, to pick one representatives, pick players who can be able to advocate. Uh, depending on the criteria, we have different rugby playing regions. We have the central, we have the eastern, we have the western, we have the northern as well. So to get players from different regions to be able to advocate, to act as regional anchors, to advocate for the different regions of rugby uh, and how to sign up these particular players, will they need to be a subscription fee? I don't think uh, the union can sustain its activities without any sort of injection of funds mm. and maybe have manners of uh, collecting these funds and the like. But it begs the question, how can we do this? How can the players do this? Well, uh, again, it's a bit of a tricky question and a tricky scenario, uh, especially because uh, I think the union, many a time, uh, through uh, uh, threatening or through, uh, what's the word? Uh, it's called a hangman's what? There's always this, this whole, for example, I've gone through uh, bringing the sport to disrepute. Yeah. Uh, they always have these tools, all this arsenal, all these things at their disposal uh, that they use uh, to come dissent or even to properly whip people into light, yeah. whatever they want. So it becomes a bit of a trick. And I think I've read a couple of articles in the past, uh, I think from Robert Mandoy and a couple of guys, uh, where he was detailing a couple of stories of how previously players have actually tried, players have tried some of these things. and. They've come unstuck because of even divide and rule from the union or go through many of uh, those tools at their disposal that they use to, you know, uh, uh, to, 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 what's the word, to uh, dissipate uh, whatever efforts are aimed at unionizing. But I inevitably, uh, the players' union is important, like you mentioned, the example of the <coughs> NBA and the collective bargaining arguments and GC. Where, for example, they made stipulations on uh, minimum wages, minimum pay, etc., yeah. or even uh, stipulations on, uh, on uh, 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 yeah. I, mean, I think it's generally about pay and, and, and player conditions that well for etc. Yeah. Uh, but uh, and, and it's a bit of a trick because you know, extrapolating some of these examples from the more developed world. Uh, to uh, Uganda is always tricky. Uh, again, because of the amateur sports setting. Uh, but a union, I think, will be the first step for me in as far as whatever efforts are concerned towards player welfare, towards professionalization is concerned. And uh, again, it uh, becomes very interesting because uh, and, and this is where the trick, you know, you know how sports for a very long time has always claimed to be independent yeah or even uh, autonomous from national laws uh, because there's a regime uh, 
as far as unionization is concerned of, of, of workers, etc. Uh, so, would we, would players, for example, go under that regime, or is there are there provisions, say, from Rugby Africa or even World Rugby, that allow the unionization of players? And, and that would be very interesting because inevitably, uh, as far as uh, legal regime is concerned in Uganda, I know for a fact that even one person can constitute yeah. the union. Uh, so perhaps, but again, someone else will argue that because, especially ever since the 2013 National Council of Sports Regulations, uh, many of these federations and associations were registered as trusts. Yes. So if you're just an under a legal regime in Uganda, can you still claim to be entirely independent? Even if you say you derive your, your existence from one rugby. Mm. It is, so it becomes very interesting. But yes, I, I think for me, inevitably, whatever mechanism is there, be it going under national laws or whatever mechanisms are provided for under world rugby, I, I, go follow through with that. And I think that will come in hard. Because I, as far as I'm concerned, for example, uh, with uh, Ivan Mangome issue, if he appeared before the disciplinary committee with his lawyer, a union representative will also have been there. A union representative, further, yes. Further pack him up. Or even as far as the, the council is concerned, uh, the council of, of URU, yes. there should be a, a union representative there. A union representative there, uh, yes. So it, it, it inevitably, for me, could be the magic wand, perhaps, and in something, if our rugby player or if our sportsman, that should be pursued aggressively. A lot of stories or rumors of some people are trying to pursue it, but I think inevitably, it is something that will come in handy. And not just, not just uh, in rugby, but generally you're going to sport. I've not really heard of any in football, which perhaps is the most developed sport, or the one that has a semblance of semi-professionalism. I've not heard of the players' union. Because I know, inevitably, any sports administrator, with the, with the sports is running in this country, wouldn't want a sports union. And the union apply all kinds of mechanisms to have it uh, fail. Dead on arrival. <laughs> Dead on arrival at this, at this nascent level, at nascent stage. So, yeah, I think for me, if you want to set up a union, even one person, as far as the law in Uganda is concerned, can set up a union. Yeah. Let's start from there. Uh, knowing how some of these rugby players are, many of them hiding under players' code of conduct. They yes. don't want to be seen out there. But inevitably, say, if Ivan Magum set up a players' union and started uh, making noise from there, or even uh, advocating for players' rights, etc. Inevitably, some guys will jump on it, uh, without a doubt. So, I, I think it is something that uh, players should get more interested in, do and perhaps educated on. And I don't know why, uh, even things like uh, bringing rugby players, maybe through podcasts, we can explore this. Yes, bringing rugby players under one roof on things concerning their welfare, minus a union representative or the union involved actually frowned at or looked at as if uh, mm. dissent or yes. as if you're... Oh, yeah, 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 I what you mean. Yes. I don't know why things like that are looked at very negatively, but like your we can start with that. Position. I mean, yeah, yes. they, I mean there, are, there are legal minds that could help with educating them or even uh, helping them structure these things. I, I think, really, uh, that for me, uh, from even a lawyer's perspective, yes, there, there could be money involved, but it is something any lawyer really would want to be involved in from an asset stage, even, even from a pro bono perspective. Yeah. Because I think it, it will go a long way in in, uh, in, in developing sport, or even uh, if you're a lawyer, leaving your mark on sport. So I think, I think that is something that should be pursued. And uh, like, I mentioned, like I mentioned earlier, uh, even one person can be, <laughs> can have a union. Yes. So there should, no, there should not be any worries about numbers. The numbers will come along, uh, along the way. For example, I, I think as far as I'm concerned, uh, these uh, baby steps by Ivan Magom uh, started the image rights matter. Now this one uh, are small steps that will eventually uh, have a ripple effect on the running of not only rugby but Uganda sport. Uh, so we just need one person like this to start uh, uh, a union, and then eventually people will, uh, will, will join him along the way. Yeah, I think when you mentioned the union yeah. and. Um, I think one of the things that it brings out very, very clearly is bargaining power. I think bargaining power is boosted to a higher platform, yeah. particularly taking into, take into account the national team engagements. I think those ones where everyone has the opportunity and the pride to yeah. represent their country, I think you have seen from the Olympics yes. how important that is and, and the like and how players particularly can be able to put themselves in a platform uh, to advocate for better conditions and the like. And I think 
I, I read an article, I think, uh, last the other week, majorly talking about how player welfare has been an issue even way back in 2016 mm -hmm. and exactly. even years before. Yes. So presidents of past have suffered with this issue. And I think it coming to the forefront, even back in the day, I think one of the key things was that a person, a player like Cyrus Wathom, appeared oh, on yes. uh, NBS, yes. uh, I think a sports show, and was basically explaining these things and saying that uh, this has been an issue. Uh, I think there have been receipts being dropped here and there, mm. uh, screenshots of back in the day of the union having organizations for, 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 for player welfare and the like. And uh, I think, it, but yes. All of this, what I'm seeing, yes. is the need for a mindset change or a paradigm shift. I think there's still a class of either former rugby players or even current mm. who still look at rugby as fun. Yes. Fun and games or leisure. Or because I played it in Namiriango. Yes. And I'm an engineer or doctor. Mm. As long as, uh, as, long as uh, uh, the game is over. But, but so look at it this way. People, yeah. Many of the boys... But look at it this way. These, 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 yeah. these former players you yeah. talk about yeah. have at least thrown their hearts in the game. And uh, you could say considerably with their under their stewardship, yeah. some of these uh, key sponsorships have come in bigger. Mm. Uh, maybe you'll say you could make an argument sake that the the leadership has <laughs> the leadership has in one way or the other through yeah. uh, galvanizing players together and improving their coaching and uh, mm. skills has yeah. made the players yeah. uh, achieve great. Mm. And uh, I mean, for players to achieve, there has to be leadership. Absolutely. So leadership has helped grow the game to a point where the players are also enjoying the benefits. I think where the problem now is the trickle down. The drip is not, the drops are not reaching uh, the ground. They are stopping somewhere. I think that's what the major concern of players is. How do you address that? Now, me, to address that, uh, I think um, uh, these things come down to communication and accountability. Mm. I think those are things that need to be uh, emphasize transparency as well. Transparency in the sense of to allay all these fears. Do they come down to people? Yeah. Mm. It could be particular people's or mindsets. Mm. I think we're now, the mindset now is that we are in a world where communication dictates how people perceive what you share. Mm. Uh, Taking, for example, the Ivan Kabagambe issue mm. where he posted and said uh, something about he put out a tweet about the welfare of the team in South Africa. And uh, he, he kind of alluded to the fact that it's because of his speaking out that he got withdrawn from the program. That may not have been the case. But in this scenario where there is an, a buzz about welfare, yes. the, the case could be made that he actually was Absolutely. bounced because of, yes, yes. because of that. And uh, this is the this is a scenario of where Ivan was taken out of the program, way at the beginning before even the national team players mm. went to South Africa. Other national team players joined him in South Africa. So if that was addressed at that point, transparency mm. or reason given why he has been withdrawn from the program, that couldn't have been used to fund the flames of the player welfare struggle that is ongoing right now. So communication. Now you see, if that was communicated earlier. And I think they will pick it up with time. But if that was communicated earlier, such issues would not have blown up into a whole blown crisis. Mm -hmm. Where even recently, I think on Friday, there was a communication. I don't think even the union has officially uh, put it out there, but in different WhatsApp groups yeah. where they were mentioning that uh, they were not applying the principle of quantum merit. Mm -hmm. They were basically saying that you, you're jumping out of the program or not or breaching the terms of the program in essence means that you avoided everything so you are not entitled to any money uh, and yet i think that principle ideally would say okay the contract has been voided but, you've done but you have done something so let's give you for the days you have done the work the other days you have forfeited them because of your initiation of the breach now if something like that had been addressed earlier or communicated. I think that would have not blown up into an issue. And so inevitably, you admit into a leadership gap. Really. Not a not a leadership not gap. Not a leadership gap. Uh -huh. There are, there are very many things you can talk about uh, this regime of uh, leadership at uh, URU that they could have not done right. 
but there are also other things they have done well. True. So I think uh, that's one of the areas I would very much want to see how they can harness some sort of uh, opportunity to grow, mm. particularly communication. If that communication comes out, because when you own the narrative, mm. it becomes easy. I know they said regarding the disciplinary, you can't hold it against them because they have said they are not going to comment on the disciplinary until the appeal is completed. Mm. Maybe that's when they'll get in front of the cameras and be able to explain the narration. And we very much hope to host uh, the union officials on the podcast as well as we uncover the, the numerous facts. But Ivan, those are things that for me personally, I would think would go a very, very long way in ensuring that these guys get uh, to a point of where these, what you would call social media outbursts, no longer and, happen. And, and some of that also comes from, and some of these things have been even recommended, um, especially in the advent of the National Sports Act, that we need more professional secretariats. Meaning, okay. these things where people uh, volunteering. volunteering. Yes. And, and, and just being there because he's a legend, they just give him an office. Yes. Uh, uh, we need professional people to run the secretariats. It should be run from a commercial business perspective. Mm. And uh, anyone who's involved in commercial business knows that there are things you can't take lightly. Like communication, for example, extractions, yes. like, you know, like things like those. So, for example, every, every club, I know he has a CEO, but uh, I'm not trying to. <laughs> yes. Uh, what's the word? Uh, not to sound harsh. I'm yes. not trying to say copy or anything like that. Yes. But uh, we just need the right people in the right places. Yeah. And they don't necessarily have to be rugby people, by the way. Mm. He doesn't have to have played rugby in the past, but. You know, this guy he says he's from the commercial world and has certain great ideas, and you know, and has certain level of, certain level of excellence can come in handy and help us uh, put our house in order. Yeah, yeah. So things like those. So for me, uh, professionalizing of secretariats comes in very, very handy. For example, look at small, small things. Just uh, if you start with small things like uh, the offices of the union. Yes. I mean things like those. Uh, we want the offices changed. <laughs> change. We need proper professional settings. I, I think the word going around is that yeah. when when all is done and dusted at Nambole, there yeah. may be a few uh, federations or unions uh, take up uh, a few office uh, okay. uh, setups there. So yeah, it's so, it's something looking forward to. Yeah. But I think when when you come to the 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 aspect of the leadership there, I think. It was an advertised job, so the best candidate was <laughs> able. The best candidate was able to, to anyway, succeed in that. Yeah, I, I, I guess, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. So now, yeah. as we wrap up, um, now contracts, player contracts. What do you think? Just a word to the players. What What are those pertinent clauses in any player contract that any player may want to come and sign? At Lok and Kia and unveil themselves as a player for this, for this team, the club, or even national team, uh, call up. What particular clauses should players, those um, players, look out for yeah. as they engage with the clubs, with the unions? What what particular aspects? I know many of us will rush to the money area, yeah. and we say that oh, I'm getting this. Yeah. Is it advisable to break it down in two months and days? Is it something that you should look at in terms of uh, image rights, uh, which property rights you're giving away of yourself? What what key clauses do you think players should be able to look out for when it comes to contracting? I have some on my mind that I think <laughs> yeah. players should look out for, but just to hear from you. Okay. Uh, uh, again, the danger of some of these things sometimes is... Uh, Comparing oranges and apples. Yes. Or extrapolating examples from the Western world where yes. things are highly professional and, and, and are working EDC. But you've mentioned, for example, image rights. Um, if a union is getting 300 million, 500 million, yes. what is there for me? Mm. There must be a bit of selfishness in uh, in negotiating yeah. and, 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 and signing some of these contracts. Because just from what we mentioned earlier, uh, image rights are personal. Mm. And because uh, beyond the fact that I'm going to play for you and do a good job for you and ensure that I'm there for training days and ensure I'm there for match days, when I see my, as a player from Hippo Zupo say the other day that <laughs> he had not gotten any consent mm. for his picture oh, to yes. appear somewhere. Yes, for his picture yeah. to appear somewhere. So yes. I, I think 
things like those really. You must understand that again, that you're beyond fun and games, you're beyond uh, uh, playing sports for physical fitness. That here is a commercial product. I'm a product mm. that guys are going to earn money from. And I am the real stakeholder in sport because it is because of you that, for example, Pat Katz is, yeah. has a show going on. Yes. It's because of you that a certain sponsor, mm. they call it sports marketing. Yes. Some guys going to reach out to some sports and tell them, but you know what, they have people playing in sport. Why did you come and invest so they can increase your mileage? And you, yes. You know? So you're the real product beyond uh, sports administrators, etc. And selfishly negotiate. Uh, of course, again, uh, it comes a bit of a tricky balancing act because uh, you're not amateur sports setting and you don't come off as if uh, overly frustrating. Uh, <laughs> frustrating. Yes. But if I'm a star player, for example, and I know I was the league's top scorer last season or I um, have certain unique attributes about me. Yes. And why don't I? Find Leverage my position yeah, to get more money. Beyond the, say, 500k, 1 million, 2 million I'm going to get, mm. should have an extra, you know, for my image rights, for it to exploit them or something like that. So, so the, the drafting of those clauses becomes very, very important. And, uh, and, and it's important that you look out for, uh, for such clauses. But you must inevitably start up for your rights as players. Because a sportsman, sportsman's uh, shelf life is limited. As opposed to a lawyer who can practice up to 90, mm. a sportsman will only have about 15 years yeah. at the peak of their powers. Or 10. Actually, 10 years 10 peak. Years, yeah. yeah. So you must, as much as possible, extract all the maximum value that you can from your career. As you see, these guys, many of them are retired, but they are still feeding off yeah. 10 years ago, ETC, and guys made a lot of money. So image rights becomes a very, very important uh, uh, important aspect. Now, importantly, from just from this dispute, bringing the game into disrepute. They call them disrepute clauses. Yes. Of course, you may find because of maybe poor contracting or poor drafting of contracts. Perhaps some uh, contracts may not have it, but it has become commonplace. It has become commonplace in many sports contracts to have something like that. So please be mindful of what of the disrepute there, clauses. The disrepute clauses. <laughs> and be mindful of that because inevitably, in this day and age, they're going to extend it to your social media. Which, which disrepute scenarios would arise in, in the Ugandan context? Maybe you would say racism, drug, racism, drug match abuse, fixing, match fixing, like the basketballer. The basketballer. Yes. Um, uh, what? Crimes in the penal court? Crime, yeah, yeah, whatever, <laughs> sexual like sexual offenses, offenses, something like that. Exactly. So inevitably. Um, yes. Yeah. And of course. Um, domestic violence domestic as well. Violence. Yeah. But, but now the best way is because a bit of a trick because again are you going into a person's personal life yeah but if that example. if that violence <laughs> attribu- is wrongly <laughs> attributed yeah. to the game the game if i'm yeah. if i'm a captain and i beat my girlfriend it's or a, i physical assault a, a yes player who's not significant who yes in second division. A, no no regardless yeah. Yeah. domestic violence domestic yeah. violence yeah. so yeah. any instance any, where any my criminal. home affairs yeah. Yeah. end up yes. bringing the yes. rugby game into being brought into the the what, frame. What have you been yes. seen with a hot belly somewhere in a little married man? Oh, now that that, that that one may be personal. That may not necessarily be. That may not be bringing yeah. the game into yeah. disrepute. Yes. So inevitably, disrepute clothes, Pay attention to them. Unless and, you're Tiger Woods. Yeah. yeah. Unless you're Tiger Woods. Yeah. Endorsements and, are being and lost, they seem and then to be yeah, yeah. Common place and yes. going to appear in sports quarters. Like I told you, some of these guys just copy and paste from wherever, and you'll find a clothes like that. So pay attention to that as a sportsman. And uh, handle your social media better. You know that now you're, you're not a normal Ivan Ojako who can post whatever he wants on his social media. Uh, you should know how to handle it. But I think also there must be room for a way of you circumventing it, say through disclaimers or something like that. Yeah. So things like that. So, uh, of course, there are other boilerplate clauses, of course, that provide for, uh, say, uh, duration of a contract, etc., etc. But importantly for sportsmen now, comes in uh, a clause or a, cont- a provision on, on injury. Injury, yes. Injury. Uh, what does the clause say? Does the clause say that when you're injured, you continue adding money or you not add money? That's that important, important, yeah. Because it's important for you to negotiate that and ensure that you continue adding money or at least find a way or have a bit of... Mm. Of course, now it ties into the other discussion on medical welfare and what have you. Yeah. Uh, medical insurance. Yeah? So... Of course, again, I am very careful when I discuss these things because I know we're in Uganda. Yes. <laughs> some of those things 
may not yeah many to many players body. many players okay. once they get yeah. injured yeah. some some players yes. obviously when they get injured may have provision from the club to yeah. support them yes. but they, they, they are, there are there a few contracts you can look at and you can clearly see that they will mention that if the injury goes beyond the fifth month yes. uh you may either be on half pay yes. or you may not get any pay at all after eight months exactly. or something like that so there may be a period of time within which no one can anticipate injuries but you as a player you have to be mindful that if i get injured what are my rights yes. in terms of remuneration or medical support properly particularly in respect to that that becomes very very important because uh, you know rugby is, is a bit uh, physical and you never yes. you know, deal with number of injuries and many players have heard stories of being abandoned by, by clubs by uh, so that that for me becomes very very important. Yeah. So the, the number of them, of course, uh, uh, I mentioned duration. I mentioned the dispute resolution clause. Know when to where to go when you have a dispute. The escalation, yes. Exactly. Actually, court has been dubbed as one of the greatest examples of bringing the sport into dispute. Yes. Because originally sports was uh, was seen as autonomous and running its own parallel legal system away from. Yeah, but over time, uh, the courts are now looking into sports matters and saying, you know what, especially where governments are finding sports and saying, no, 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 but we can come and look into your affairs. But though the principle has been that, first exhaust the internal, All internal remedies. remedies. Yes. Then perhaps if you're not happy, then you, you go to court. Yeah, but inevitably, uh, it will be quickly, you may rush to court yet you have a certain mechanism in place. Though, uh, unfortunately, in our part of the world, <laughs> many yes. times those mechanisms will be on paper. But yes. there actually be no proper... No, but if you sign a contract, you, you are obliged to <laughs> adhere to that. No, but if there's that, and I have experience from yes. some business. Yeah, if there's that, then you, know, you, you can go to court. Because yeah, I think the principle, and, uh, they, call them, they call them ouster clauses, uh, clauses that oust the jurisdiction of the high court. Yes. Is that it must be properly clear. It must yes. be a proper, clearly laid out mechanism. Well, it's not there, even if it's on paper. You can always go to court and tell them, but I tried exploring this, I watched to them, no, no one replied. Um, I'm there for here. So, yeah, this so, so, very so now, yeah. to cheat the exam, yeah. when it comes to matters where you need to escalate as a player, yeah. would you recommend players to to file to to file the the letter or the communication as required under their contract or as per the laws? And then, if that comes up and nothing has been done, then you can utilize other means. Yes. Uh, inevitably, you have to demonstrate to court that I've tried to as much as possible exhaust all internal remedies. And also the principles of judicial review. Uh, yes. For being more legal knowledge. Uh, judicial review says that you must explore all the available mechanisms of resolving this dispute before you go to court. So, for formality's sake, if you know that there's nothing there, but just try to file. So, when yes. the judge asks you, like, yeah, I tried, I explored them. I explored I them. the arbitration clause. Yes. No one called me for arbitration. I tried talking to these people, no one. Therefore, that's why I'm here. There must be a remedy for me. Yeah. The law cannot just be there and they cannot get a remedy. Yeah, so uh, for me, uh, that is very, very important for people to pay attention to and to know how to. It doesn't matter whether you're biased and you know that the guys who are there, no one's going to give you justice. You just go there <laughs> mm. for the sake of it uh, and you just prepare your case as you get it ready to go to the high court uh, yeah. so that you can get proper, proper justice. Yeah. So uh, for now, Edwin, I think of. Uh, me personally, I think maybe yeah. also, I think one of the key things for rugby also is about, I think, not working hours per se, yeah. but times when required mm. is, is something very, very important. Yeah. I think at times some clubs may use the loophole of uh, reporting time to kind of uh, strike yeah. the way. Because you see when clubs at times, due to different interests that yeah. they are trying to push, yeah. may it be forced to discipline some players yeah. on particular issues. So may I also think aspect of time reporting for training, reporting for game time is something very, very clear. Yeah. Uh, at times, many, many players are either students yeah. or have uh, jobs that can spe creep into rugby time True. and that could be used against you as a rugby player. So as ever much you're trying to chase your hustle or your calling elsewhere, you must be mindful of any provisions of time in your agreement because but, that can come but, to but so, bite you. This is what I also think. Yeah. It doesn't matter whether a club, if, if a club is properly committed, if they're yes. paying 100k per month, yes. that is a job. That's you're, a job. Properly yes. Paid on a job. Exactly. So it's like you doing three jobs at the same time. Yes. You have to make sure that you. The hours don't exactly. overlap. Yes. So inevitably, you have to find over by that contract. Yes. And complying. Otherwise, you'll be in trouble. 
Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. It's only where, I mean, you just being uh, club doesn't pay you, this is fine. Maybe, yes. maybe there you can get away with it. But where there are proper stipulations and you know, you decided who, I mean, you can as well become a fan if you wanted. If yeah. there's little money, you could as well have retired a long time ago. But you decided to play rugby and there's a payment coming through and it comes through regularly and you know, guys, proper uh, comply with your side of the bargain. Then please try and comply. Inevitably, in case you you run afoul of that contract, they'll, they'll come after you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now, parting shots. Um, personally, uh, when it comes to disrepute in the sports, I think it's also very unique for me because also me, not a particular area of interest, but at least I've taken a lot of uh, time off from the business schedule to at least try to understand from a sports law perspective what it means to bring a particular sport of rugby, for example, into distribute. Yeah. Now, majorly, uh, maybe just word of advice to those, uh, maybe whether, whether fans can be also held accountable for bringing the game into distribute is something maybe within the confines of the game, but we can discuss that even on a, on a Twitter space or something along those lines. But me, majorly, is that as players, um, the union has a right to discipline you. Yeah. Uh, because it's a sporting discipline, the understanding is that discipline is at the forefront of all this. Mm. So you will be asked to account for your behavior as and when it is deemed to be in violation. Mm. I think now as players is that the role or the obligation starts with you to be able to put yourself in a position where you don't violate uh, these particular player codes, mm. put yourselves in a position where you do not because you see it's very very it's common you 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 could be hard done by a bad decision on the field yeah. and you go on social media and twitter and they say referee edwin is yeah. a cheat yeah or is a thug how can you not call this and in doing so you're kind of imputing that a referee True. is is biased or something and in doing so you are saying that the refereeing society is biased mm. and you're bringing the game of rugby to distribute because you're saying this particular club will never win when those referees are in charge. So as players also, you need to be mindful of particular comments. Now, how you try to circumvent that with a disclaimer, obviously that may not necessarily work for you, but it's, it, it puts the players also to live up to a standard of discipline. Uh, notwithstanding, I think the union is not an entity that will only sanction for the sake yeah. unless there is reason to do so. So as players, I think players need to do their best to to put themselves in a position and manage their affairs that they don't uh, float these rules. Okay. So, Ivan, last shot on uh, distribute and um, contracting, and then we can uh, wrap this up. I, I, I think, and uh, again, back to the aspect of leadership, I think some of these things, uh, I think sometimes we perhaps overestimate some of these people because you think they're educated you think a player is because an engineer or whatever yeah. he knows the rules it's possible the guy has even never read those rules never read the he rules, yes. rugby, he goes to play every weekend what if the union went out of its way to ensure that sort of an orientation yes precision precision kind of an orientation i don't know whatever they call them seminars or whatever to educate the players on this is these are the rules but also you know what education also does Education also allows opinion and stakeholder event in engagement. In yeah. Some things. If a player thinks that is an overly vague rule, then they'll have opinions. They'll have, they'll, have, uh, they'll, they'll submit their opinions that perhaps mm. the union, in good faith, should be able to take them into account and find a way of either amending the rules or properly clear, clarifying or, you know, things like those. So, it is something that I think the union should invest in, in getting experts, etc., to explain some of these things to some of these players. Because, see, you don't want to. Because now, in as much as some people have never heard of that term, bringing the sport into the street, like, what, what is yeah. this? Yeah. Then the term has been around. Many of the sports law principles were the or, original conceptions of them were in good faith. Yes. Most of the time, they've been abused. Because many times, unequal bargaining power between the sports governing body and the players, etc. And also for selfish reasons by uh, many sports administrators. But uh, for me, I think things like those will go a long way in ensuring that there's some level of, uh, what's the word, being on the same page or, yeah. or, or same level. A of mutual understanding. Because yeah. it, it's now as if there's a certain level of high-handedness 
a high handedness as if uh, there's some dictator up, up there and yesterday you must do this, you must do this. So for me, that uh, humility in leadership and many times coming down to the level mm. of a sportsman and ensuring that, you know what, these are the rules. This is what you must follow. This is, this is what the law says. If you uh, breach this rule, they're going to punish you like this, like this, like this. Because that, for that interaction, trust me, there'll be uh, no one will have excuses of, of you know, uh, of, uh, yeah. uh, of uh, we didn't know about this, we think this is overly vague, we think you're yeah. uh, over-applying yourself here at ETC. So, uh, well, the argument would be that ignorance of the law is no defense, but you'd be amazed by how many people have never looked at some of these documents. And, yeah, and many of them, them have come to our light only recently because of this Magomo incident. So, uh, for me, that becomes very, very important. But also, importantly, in as a sports governing body, as a sports regulator, uh, there must be a way of whipping into, into, into a straight line or into... Uh, proper, what's the word, whipping these clubs. Because many times you blame the union, Yes. yet a lot, many of the problems start from the club. From the club, yes. Has the club properly contracted the player? What does the club have in place as far as player welfare is concerned? Of course, mm. there's a bit of a problem in Uganda because it seems the union seems to play both as a regulator, regulator and, and welfare provider, <laughs> even welfare <laughs> provider, and a commercial pro player in the market. Yes. So because and, and because of that, there's some things that may not be may be a bit of a problem. Because, for example, clubs may say that we don't even have individual sponsors. Eh? Yes. Things like those. You get it. Yeah. So, the you know, like, again, it comes out to a broader governance question, but also whipping into place, whipping into uh, into a straight line some of these clubs and ensuring that hey, but do you have contracts for all your players? Yeah. What do you have in place? Yes. Of course, the argument would be that we don't, we don't have money or whatever, or whatever. But yes. That again comes down to how the union will handle that in terms of the trickle down yes. of money to the clubs and eventually to the player. So there's a wider governance issue that for me needs to be resolved as far as the running of sport and rugby in Uganda is concerned. And uh, I, I think, again, it unfortunately goes back to the leadership question. Yes, the leaders have done well. We can't say they have uh, been pathetic or they have been incompetent throughout their whole tenure. There are so many positives. But I believe uh, many a time you want to compare yourself to the best or to the, uh, to the best people out there in the world. And I think that is a standard that they should be aiming at. Yeah, so, uh, but first things first. Please contract players. <laughs> the most basic of basics, contract players. Uh, by contracting players, it ensures that even these arguments of bringing the sport into disrepute, you don't find people uh, being shocked. Being shocked, or even they are aware that uh, what they even, did was or, wrong. Or even calling out the union on, 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 on Twitter, it is. I believe, and I'm sure many people are hearing about this stuff for the very first time. Yet I remember it even first came out. I think when Rujumba, Chambo, Chambo, Rujumba, but also Chambo when Chambo went to court. Yes, I think it was a letter from uh, from the union saying that yes. bringing the sport into disrepute by going to court. Oh, yes. Chambo went to court, yes. Yeah. That would have been a very good decision, by the way, but for some reason. No, it has been overtaken by events. There's nothing you can do now. I don't, I don't. It's more of like being withdrawn. It's being withdrawn. It was really going to be a good Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, so yeah, I think for me, there's a border governance question. And that needs to be resolved in order for our sports, and not only rugby, but generally, to move forward. Yes, and the right people in leadership, we need more selflessness and then I believe eventually our sportsmen will be happy and us, who they bring glory to or who, 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 who they make happy every weekend, yeah. we'll also enjoy ourselves and we'll get distractions away from the problems of work and, and, and family and yeah. girlfriends and things. Yeah, yeah um, thank you very much, uh, Fatcats Podcast on that particular matter. What does it mean to bring a sport into disrepute? And also touching a little bit on player welfare. This is uh, part two of the uncovering of the facts series, where we would very much dedicate time to resolving the issues surrounding the disciplinary proceedings uh, involving Ivan Magom, but also the broader picture of welfare of players, as well as addressing the plight and concerns uh, following uh, the decision 
coming from the Uganda Rugby Union. And uh, wishing you all the best and keep it fat cuts as we bring more discussions, hopefully to have representative from the union and maybe particular players to address what they need to be done in respect to welfare. Thank you. Thanks for listening in. Share with us your thoughts from today's episode. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and subscribe to our YouTube channel.